How is everybody? Doing well. Must be sleepy. I only heard Kelly say he's doing well and it was at a mumble. <laughs> How is everybody today? Good. Are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> Don't lie to me. Are you good? Some of you got smiles on your face, so that's at least comforting. Some of you need to tell your face what Jesus is doing in your hearts. <laughs> that's enough. I'll get, I'll get on topic. We're going to talk about the kingdom for the next five weeks. As I talked to Kelly, he asked me and he said, take a week, take whatever. And he's never told me that before. And so I sat down and I prayed and I started getting all this information. And I looked at the, the overwhelming information that I was receiving from the Lord. And I came to him and I was like, uh, Kelly, I'm going to make your jaw drop. <laughs> and of course, when I say that to Kelly, he doesn't know what I'm going to do. Uh, and so he said, I said, eight weeks. And he goes, uh, all the way through Easter? And I said, well, I wasn't planning on it, but I don't even know when Easter is. <laughs> and so it was a really funny conversation. Uh, and then he said, how about five weeks? And I said, I'll try to make it work. So you might be extra the last two weeks where we just go past it. Yeah. All right, so be prepared. <laughs> just kidding. It's okay. You can laugh. God laughs. He does have joy. All right. January 1. Kelly gets up here and he preaches a message that said, New Year, New Things. Anybody remember the scripture that he used? No? Come on, that was a, like the message to start the year on. Like Kelly's up here like, we're going to see God do different things. Kelly, do you remember the scripture? You want to put me on the spot, yeah. sure. Yeah, if you would ask me, I probably wouldn't have known if I didn't go back and look. <laughs> so I'm just as guilty. Isaiah 43 was the passage. Huh? I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. Exactly what it said. Isaiah 43 verses 18 through 21 is what Kelly preached on that day. And God talks about doing a new thing. And then a week later, the 8th of January, Kelly gets up and he preaches a message about vision and mission for this body what God has us to do. Yes? Anybody remember this? Anybody know the, the mission statement by memory yet? No, me neither. It says this, to lead people into an authentic, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ by knowing and living his word, showing God's love to people and helping to build up the family. That's a powerful statement. Are we committed? Are we committed? Because it has to happen in your personal life before we can do it in our public life. But see, our, our vision was even deeper. Every member, that's you, that's me, is to have a life-altering experience with Jesus affecting how they interact with the Lord. Have you been affected yet? Like, this is what I imagine in my mind here. If you're affected, it's almost like you've been infected, right? So it's like a zombie apocalypse only from Jesus. It's all right. You didn't get it. <laughs> Affecting how we interact with the Lord, their families, and the community. Is God altering your life right now? To clarify all of that mission, all of that vision, reaching up, reaching out. Bringing in. That's our goal. We're going to see a lot of things change coming as we begin to study the Word of God deeper as a body of believers, as we begin to press in the Lord. Some changes we're comfortable with, some changes we're not. Trust me, it'll mess with all of us. All of us. Even the ones that think they're okay with change. See, I was reading in Hosea the other day, and it says, those who get comfortable forget who I am. See, the only thing that doesn't change is God. He didn't change when he created the earth, and he's not going to change when we meet him face to face. But everything in life changes. How many of you guys, you're not a baby scooting in and here on your butt anymore? Anybody? Some of you like, I wish I could go back less bills. So from there, Kelly began 
a powerful series. Very powerful series. And I love this because he jumps into the parables in January 15th. He says, are you ready to receive the word? He begins to speak on the parables of the four swords, explaining this, and Jesus explains it for us so it makes it easy on a pastor. We don't have to go and like dive in and come up with something. It's right there. But I thought it was interesting because all of the parables start off with something. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. And this parable starts off and it says, when the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven is preached, Satan comes to steal it. Okay? Keep that in mind. In that same passage in Matthew, chapter 13, where Kelly was preaching, there is a prophetic word that comes straight out of the Old Testament. If I can turn to the right page here. 13. Verses 14 and 15 says this. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With ears they have scarcely hear, and with eyes they have closed. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. This one messed me up. God didn't say, I covered their ears and their eyes so they wouldn't understand. He said, they hardened their hearts and they covered their own ears. Some of us aren't hearing from God and understanding the kingdom because we are doing it to ourselves. If I don't know what he says, I don't have to obey. If I don't know what he says, I don't have to listen. Time to unplug our ears as Kelly got into that message. Then on the 22nd, Kelly began to preach about sowing the good seed. Right? The master goes into the field and has a servant sow seed. And in the night, the enemy comes and sows the tares. Right? So Kelly opens up this parable to us with a lot of revelation. And what's interesting is Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to cut all the tears out right now. No, no, leave the problem. Because when the weather comes and the weather is right, the harvest will be produced. And we'll see that the wheat is beginning to become heavy. And the non-wheat is still straight up and we're going to pluck the wheat, uh, non-wheat out. Right? The tares. And then Kelly begins to preach on January 29th, the message of forgiveness. Did anybody else get, like, stabbed with that one a little bit? Like, did you, like, immediately start processing, I need to forgive this person, or I need to really practice forgiveness? Because it says in the word there, if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. That hurts a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Hurt me. Because then I'm like, is there something that I haven't confessed, Lord? Right? So he begins to show the master settling accounts with this parable. The great master says, oh, I'll forgive you. You came and won. And that master, the servant turned around and give me my stuff to the next servant. And then the master says, you who do not know how to forgive are being cast out. So Kelly set these parables up, reading them as the gospel says, the kingdom of heaven is one. And then on the 5th of uh, February, will you accept the invitation? God literally has an invitation for you and me to be at his table. Are we going to the marriage feast? Are we going to the banquet? Are we showing up in the right clothes? There's a kingdom clothing in that passage. And then he gets to the, the parable of the, the ten virgins, and he talks about lighting the torches and God following God. And he says, salvation isn't a group project. You can't get oil from somebody else. You have to have an encounter with God yourself. And then, wrap it all up, to beat me on the head, I don't know about you guys, but then it says, using your talents for the kingdom and multiplying what God gave you. 
Of course, Kelly brought out a really interesting point about salvation here that I don't think a lot of pastors cover. I thought it was a beautiful picture. This is the opportunity for all of us to accept salvation and walk in it, increase our faith, increase our walk with the Lord. Man, that, that passage stings. So that brings us to today, right? You got all those memorized yet? <laughs> like, I was reading my notes in my Bible. I literally went back and read these things, right? You can go back and watch them on YouTube if you didn't get it. It's on the church website. If you missed a week, get the information. It's valuable. All of these parables speak of the kingdom of heaven. And this lead, led me to a question that I've been asking for a while. What is the kingdom of heaven? Have you ever asked yourself that? Think about this. How many times have you heard somebody say something about the kingdom of heaven and tell you it was like something because they read the parable, but then show you nothing about the kingdom? Not blaming Kelly. I'm guilty myself. Okay? So don't like hear this as a slap to Kelly because I think Kelly has been preaching the kingdom. But when I reflect on my own walk in Jesus and all of the sermons I sat under, nobody really teaches the kingdom. That is the only message that Jesus preached. It is. From the time he began his ministry to the time he left resurrected, he preached kingdom. It's interesting to me, we, we preach salvation which is the first step to kingdom, but we don't want to go past kingdom, into the kingdom. See, kingdom is mentioned 162 times in the New Testament. It's kind of daunting, 162 times. I love the church. In Matthew, right, before the book of Acts, Matthew is the only book out of the Gospels that mentions the church. You know how many times Jesus mentioned the church? Three times. After that point in the entire New Testament, the gospel of the church is preached 117 times. Or 114, excuse me. There's 117 total in the, in the Bible. Jesus taught the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and we preach the church. You ever heard somebody say, well, we got to build the church. Some of you are about to call me a heretic. It is not our job to build the church. The church is the vessel in which God uses to build the kingdom. Amen. Hear that. The church is a vessel which God uses to build the kingdom. And I want to get into this. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, this is the first message of Jesus. He says... The kingdom of heaven, or from that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message. Not repent and be born again. Not repent and get saved. Not repent and go to church. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 3, he finishes his ministry. And from in between those pages, it's all kingdom. In those pages, on verse 3 of Acts, he says this. The scripture says this, excuse me. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering. So Jesus is resurrected. He's alive. By many convincing proofs, he appears to them over a period of 40 days. I think it's interesting because it says many proofs. He couldn't just show up and say, I'm Jesus. To one, he has to let them touch the holes on the side of his body and in his hands. <coughs> to others, he has to sit there and take food in. I'm not a ghost. But he reveals himself over and over again to say this in that scripture. For 40 days, and speaking the things concerning the kingdom of God. If Jesus 
thought it was so important for us to understand the kingdom of God, my question is, 2,000 years later, why don't we have a full grasp of the kingdom of God? Right? Maybe we're covering that cross. Eyes, ears, mouth, it may look like see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, but it really is see no kingdom, hear no kingdom, speak no kingdom. Jesus spent his entire ministry with the kingdom of God. The kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, and the disciples said, why do you speak in parables? They're not ready, but you are. But Jesus, we don't get it. Let me explain it to you. Let me bring you into the revelation knowledge that you are already supposed to have, disciples. Today, we must accept Jesus' first message. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. And now we talk about repentance a lot with sin. Stop sinning. Turn away from sin. Get away from sin. The word repent means this. To change your thinking. I don't know about you, but change your thinking, Jesus said. It's no longer about the kingdom of heaven being in a tabernacle hidden behind a holy of holies piece of fabric in a room where only one man could go. The kingdom has come. It's on earth like it was supposed to be. When we change our thinking, we change our actions. When we change our actions, we change our lifestyle. Anybody aware of that? Like you're like, I'm gonna start working out, it's a new year. If you don't start working out, you don't work out. You don't change your habits, right? Same thing with the kingdom. If we don't change our mind about what Jesus said about the kingdom and repent, we don't know the kingdom. We have to uncover our ears. Now, I still haven't answered the question, right? Some of you are like, Andy, what's the kingdom of heaven? You're just giving us the verse that you commonly hear in church. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is here. Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And he, all these things will follow you. Ever heard those verses? Yeah. I bet. I heard them all the time. But I missed the kingdom. Oh God, I want to seek you. Seek first the kingdom. So we have to change our framework. We have to change our paradigm today. We have to be a church that is willing to step into the mission and vision that God has given Kelly over us. This is from the Lord. It is not a Kelly came up with this. This is after months of prayer and seeking God that God says, this is what this body is going to be in this community. Let me ask you this. If Spring Creek closed down today, building gone, none of us here, would you notice? Or would you just move to a different church? But more importantly, if, if this building stopped existing, if we stopped gathering together, if we stopped bringing our resources together, if we stopped doing life together, would West Plains notice? Would Howe County notice? Or would they just go, didn't impact us? There was nothing there. It's a hard question. You've heard this verse, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So what is the kingdom? I'm gonna reference somebody much smarter than I am, uh, Dr. Miles Monroe. He gives a definition of the kingdom that um, blew me away. When I read it in his book, when I heard it, right, it says this. In, the kingdom is this, an actual country ruled by a king who influences and impacts the domain of his kingdom personally with his values, morality, lifestyle, and his entire principles and the laws until the people begin to reflect his lifestyle. Did you hear it? The kingdom is this, an actual country. It is a location. By a king, God Almighty, 
Jesus Christ, who influences and impacts the domain where he rules of his kingdom personally. He interacts with us personally. He's the God that we get to know. With his values, his morality, his lifestyle, his entire principles and laws until we reflect who the king is. You know what the worst thing I hear about Christians in society? They're a bunch of hypocrites. They say one thing and they live another. That's not how Jesus reflected the king. It's not how he reflected his father. If that's how the church or the world sees the church, it's because we built <coughs> church and not kingdom. See, kingdom is essentially this. When you look at it in the Greek and the Hebrew, it says this. Kingdom is where the king has dominion and rule. Heaven is God's throne. The earth is his footstool. He rules both of them. But what he gave us is totally different. When he created man in Genesis chapter 1, <coughs> verse 27, or 26 and 27, he said, let's make man in our image, giving him our dominion over the earth. His rule through us over his creation. You know what happened a couple chapters later in Genesis 3? We were unable to handle the rule of God because we listened to the lies of an unemployed <coughs> cherub. Well, take our rule. Enslave us. We're not smart enough. God's not good enough. And we walked into slavery Losing the dominion of the kingdom of God. And from that moment on, Jesus was sent and prepared to be sent to us to bring the kingdom back. So when he shows up, he says, repent. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. God's dominion on earth. This is my version of what kingdom is. As I, I began to assess this, kingdom consists of this. A king, the king, his country, his kingdom, his citizens, his concepts, his constitution, his court, his ability to be caretaker of all of his subjects and people, his subjects consecrated for the conforming of his customs, his rule and dominion. That's where I want to live. That's where I want to be. I want to be an ambassador for Jesus. I don't know if you know anything about ambassadors. When they are in another country, they literally are the country that they come from. They're not a person. If you touch an ambassador, you have created an international crime because you came against a country. They don't send one man to get you. They send the entire militia, the military, after you for touching the ambassador. But the ambassador has one job. I can only say what my country and my king tells me to say. That one will get us a lot in trouble. I can only say what Jesus told me to say. How do you feel about pro-life or pro-choice? I don't have an opinion. My king loves life. How do you feel about homosexuality moving into the United Methodist Church and they accepting it and making it their ministers? My God defies sin. I don't have an opinion. People can be mad at me for stating the truth of God, and I will stand on it, regardless of their opinion. But I don't have an opinion. I have the word of God, his voice, and his opinion, his kingdom. If we are going to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we have to know the kingdom. We have to repent and change our mind. Understand this. Write this down. Jesus did not come to establish religion. He came to establish a country and a kingdom where the king has dominion. I don't want to break some people's heart, but there are some songs in the past, and I love hymns. There are good hymns out there. Give me that old time religion. I'll fly away. Oh, glory. They're good. They sound great. But let me ask you this. If Jesus wants to build a kingdom, why, is, why are we so desperate to leave earth? He didn't say, I want to build my kingdom in heaven, 
It's already established. I want my kingdom on earth. He did not come to build religion. Jesus was not religious. Actually, the, person, the people he had the most offense with was the religious order. He went to synagogue as custom to preach the kingdom. He went and preached the kingdom outside of the synagogue, and it offended the religious people. This message will offend religious people. So today, if you're religious, I am sorry. I may offend you. I'm going to apologize for that, but I will not apologize for God's word says here. He didn't come to build religion. You're like, how do you know that, Andy? Read James 1, 26 and 27, when he talks about true religion is taking care of the orphans and the widows. It's not about sacrifice and religious order and structure. See, religion builds a monument or a museum where something happened. See, religion goes back to, if we do this custom and we practice this principle over and over again, God might listen to us. Religion looks like this, and I'm not picking on that denomination, but it looks like this. I'm gonna pick up the rosary, and I'm gonna say my prayers over and over again of the same prayer around these beads. Religion looks like this, coming to a building on the same day of the week to sing the same number of songs and sit in the same place. Religion looks like ritual. Now, there are rituals in the kingdom, so we have to be careful here. I'm not trying to say we can't have these things, but religion becomes a place where dead bones are. And then God made a kingdom, and Satan saw a chance to duplicate a religion. Why do we have so many world religions? Because if Christianity just looks like another thing, you can get to heaven any way you want. You can live your life any way you want. And Christians can even do whatever they want because we're free. That's what religion says. He came to build kingdom. Now see, some of you already know right now. You are looking at me like, let's stone him, throw him out of the church. He's offended my religion. He's offended me. Whatever. He's a heretic. I'm not. Some of you have never been polluted by religion. And I say amen. Because the spirit of religion is suffocating the church today. Some of us already understand the kingdom. Some of you are way ahead of me on the kingdom. I wish I knew more. Like I have been studying nonstop. My wife always tells me to go to bed. And I don't go to bed on time because I, like, I just keep getting up and doing things to try to know more and seek more. But I want you to realize, I'm not saying you're gonna lose your faith. I'm saying you have to lose your religion. Now the catch is this. God is not trying to build the church he is trying to build the kingdom. He's not trying to build religion. Okay? So hear that. He is using his tool, his vessel, the bride of Christ. That's us. To manifest kingdom life on earth. See, Christians is not what we're supposed to be called. I know that's a little like, ah, throw them off the stage. Anybody ready to get rid of me? No? No hands? Okay. No pitchforks yet. God never called us to be Christian. You know what Christian means? It means little Christ. You know who told us that? The Romans who were trying to be derogatory towards them. They said, these people follow this guy and they're dying foolishly. These people are dumb. They're little Christ. And we went, oh, that sounds good. We'll call ourselves Christians and we'll make a religion out of it. Jesus wasn't a Christian. He was Christ. And that sounds weird. I'm not woke. Don't worry. I promise. He did not make us Christians. But if that's the term the world needs to know us by, then we need to make a different lifestyle for Christianity. Simply this. Christians ought to be a term for those who follow Jesus and his teaching. That means we obey. That means we do what he calls us to do, and we don't do the things we're not supposed to. The, the term Christian in today's society, we get called hypocrites for, and this is why. This is what I began to reflect on. It is a term for religious people who may 
or may not follow God, but use the rule of God to enforce it on non-citizens of the kingdom. Did you hear it? We use the standard of religion to impose somebody who doesn't know Jesus out there to do what we want, whether we do it or not. And that's why we're called hypocrites. That, that, that hit me, because it's like, when I walk into a store, do people see Jesus? Do they see the kingdom of God? Do they see the blessing of God? Or do they see a grumpy person who doesn't want to be at Walmart? When I go and work for somebody, do I give them all of my time and energy and effort? Or do I mess around? Do I steal from the clock? See, if we're imposing our beliefs on non-Christians and they're not following it and we get mad, then there's something wrong with our Christianity. Because it wasn't meant for them. It was meant for us. How many of you guys watched the Grammys, heard about the Grammys? Anybody keep up with that fun stuff? The devil worshiping, you probably saw it on the news. A song where they come out right after a Christian band receives a bunch of awards and barely any clapping happens. This debauchery of God comes out on stage. And you know how God responds? He didn't say, oh man, I wish my church would go pick it outside that band or throw CDs and burn them. He said, revival. Let's just, let's just stir hearts back to the kingdom. Yeah. They get five people? I got millions. If they're willing to follow me. If they're willing to live kingdom life. See, now that I've offended you, because I know I have, I'll hear about it, sure. That's okay. Write this point down. Do not miss this point. Jesus did not come to get you to heaven. He did not come to earth to get you to heaven. He came to earth to restore heaven in you to bring his rule back on earth. Hear it loud and clear. He did not come to bring you to heaven. And that's why songs like I'll Fly Away bother me. I'm not saying it's a bad song. I love to sing the song. Matter of fact, if Doug got up and played it, I would sing with you, Doug, because I love it. And I know you don't want me to sing with you, but I'll sing. I love the, the message of the song, but Christians have spent so much of their time trying to get to heaven, to leave earth, to evacuate, to escape, to get out of all the trials and tribulation, and forgot about the other one that isn't part of the 99. That hurts. Think about this. If I mention one name, I bet you I can offend at least half the congregation in here. Joe Biden. <laughs> Did you pray for him today? Did you ask for God to, to give him salvation? Or did you say, God, move him out of office? Amen. <laughs> Religion versus kingdom, right there. <laughs> See, my God is the same God that changes hearts in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and now. God has a plan for Joe Biden. He just hasn't accepted it. He hasn't sought him because he hasn't seen kingdom life lived out. I can offend you with a lot of names. I can list a lot of people. Maybe your boss isn't a Christian. Do you grumble against them? Or do you bring heaven into the office, into the school, into the workplace, into the grocery store, into your neighborhood? How about this? At your own kitchen table with your family. Are they going to get the kingdom of heaven or are they going to get the kingdom of hell from you? Let that just sink in. He came to restore what was stolen in Genesis and give it back to us. I'm going to jump into a lot of scripture. So bear with me. But to get this concept of why I'm telling you he came to bring kingdom is this. In Matthew, Chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. And I didn't put this on the screen today, so if you have your phone and you have it on that, pull up your lightsaber, get the word of God out. 
you got your text in front of you, pull out the Word of God. If there's one in the pew, get the Word of God. Because here's what I realized. I went to a meeting with all kinds of pastors. And I'm not trying to be judgmental. You know how many people brought their Bible? This guy. It was the Gideon's banquet. They had a bunch of little New Testaments on the table and some that they pulled out of their pocket with joy. But I, my heart broke when they started quoting scripture from the stage and there wasn't even phones out. It wasn't like, oh, I got it on my, my lightsaber. We are so dull that we don't want the word of God like we ought to. So I want you to turn to the pages. I want you to look. I want you to pull up your phone right now if you've got the Bible app and you don't have it open. Seriously, I'll wait. Some of you aren't moving. It's okay. <laughs> Jesus teaches his disciples to pray in this passage. It's known as the Lord's Prayer. It's really the disciples' prayer. It's a model prayer for us to practice. We can say this prayer. We don't have to always say this prayer. But he said, pray then in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom, what? Come. Come. Your will be, Come. where? On earth. Are you sure? It doesn't say in heaven? As, as it is in heaven. On earth, as it is currently going on where he sits. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For yours is the what? And kingdom. And? And, power. and? Glory. Forever. Amen. Did you hear it? If the kingdom comes on earth as his will is being done, it brings not only the kingdom, but power and glory to the king. Mm -hmm. And power through us to meet the king. And to do the miraculous things that Jesus said, more than these you will do also. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, and then I was like, okay, so he said to bring the kingdom. But Lord, is there a passage where you just blow my mind about the kingdom as I've been studying this? And I want you to jump over to Luke chapter 1. Anybody know, familiar with Luke 1 before we get there? You know what's happening in that passage? Jesus isn't born yet. This is the nativity story, right? The one we love to only teach at Christmas for some reason. Luke chapter 1, 26 through 33. Look at this promise that God speaks. Luke chapter 1, 26 through 33. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to, be a, to a, a man whose name was Joseph, a descendant of David, and virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at the statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have been found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Now here's where it gets good. If that wasn't good enough before, he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, the throne that God said would never end, right? And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. You know what God told Mary that day? Hey, through you, I'm putting the kingdom of heaven back on earth. He didn't bring it to a rabbi, a Pharisee, a king. He brought it to a humble woman who was favored by God and said, through you, you get to raise the king of the universe and help him establish his kingdom on earth. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. I have no gimmicks and no tricks today. I even brought a crown just for Kelly this morning, but that was it. So it's already been done because I gave it to him before. Because uh, he wanted one last week if you remember. Matthew chapter 5. Go backwards here. 
Matthew chapter 5. I wanted to read the whole passage. We're not going to, but we're going to start at verse 17 and go through 20. I would encourage you to read the whole chapter, though. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is accomplished. Whoever annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever teaches them shall be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Rick can attest to you to this. We work together. I've been turning on my phone and blaring a mu some music, worship music, every once in a while. But I've been playing the scripture nonstop, listening to the gospels, right, Rick? And so we have good conversations as verses come up. And as this passage came up, it struck me. I heard it in a different way. And I literally asked him, I said, how do we exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? Like, how? If we seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, everything will be given to us. But the scribes and the Pharisees are supposed to be the most righteous. And Rick had a brilliant answer. I don't remember a word for word, so sorry, I can't quote you. But um, as I asked him this question, and he, he opened my eyes to it, and the Holy Spirit began to really speak. The righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was religion. It was literally a religious order. I do this, I pray here, I say this, I move here, I do this, I fast, I Sabbath, I enter whatever. You know what the righteousness of God is? It's a, not a trick question. Do the kingdom on earth. You know why? Because he's a righteous God. There is no corruption in his kingdom. You want his righteousness? You want to exceed that of the Pharisees? Then live the kingdom life. It, it just baffles me. And so at the beginning of this passage, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come to get rid of the prophets. I came to fulfill it. So here's what you need to see, and this is what's been really opening my eyes. When you start in Genesis and you read all the way through the Old Testament and get right up to Matthew, every single one of those books points to the coming of the king. It is not, a, okay, well, here's a ritual, and here's a religion, here's this. God literally said, I need to give you this information so my kingdom can come. I'll send you my law that you can't handle. I'll send you my prophets who speak my word and you're going to kill them so that I can send my son who you can't handle and you will kill because he's going to give his life up for you so that you get the kingdom. See, that's all of the New Test Old Testament. It's all about the kingdom. It's all about Jesus. Every single passage I can show you. Jesus is in there somewhere in his kingdom. And then you jump into Matthew and it begins this. And I'm like, God, give me a revelation. I need to understand what you mean by this because I want to know how we don't have to follow the law, quote unquote, as religious people say. Or how come, yes, we do have prophetic words still spoken today, but we don't need prophets in the order of the place to talk about the Messiah coming. He already came, except for the second coming, right? So then I question this, and I begin to search and research and study and look at things in Matthew chapter 17. There is a powerful picture here. Many of us have studied this passage and we think it's the most amazing thing because Jesus was transfigured. You know the passage? Here's a quick paraphrase. Jesus grabs his three closest friends. He says, hey, my father told me to come to this mountain. Let's go. Okay, Jesus. They get up on the mountain and you know who shows up? Not dead people. They're in the grave, but Moses and Elijah are standing there with Jesus. And it says Jesus was transfigured, and we love that. He's, he's giving the glory of God, and how beautiful. It's, it's beautiful, yes. But watch what happens in this passage. Starting in verse 1. 
Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and his brother and led them up on the high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. The law and the prophets are with Jesus. Hear it, right there, talking with him. Peter says, Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I will make three tabernacles for you and Moses and one for Elijah. And we'll stay up on the mountain and worship you, God. We'll just stay here. Do you see where Peter went immediately? Religion. Oh, this is a miracle. I get to see things that nobody else gets to see. God, can we build you a tabernacle? Can we make this spot holy? Can we stand here in your presence? And I love this. As soon as he speaks this, while he was speaking, he doesn't even get to finish his little lecture to Jesus about how great he wants to make this little throne room for God. It says this. A bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son. This is a king. The second time the father speaks over Jesus and said, This is my son. He is next in line. He's on the throne. He's king. Here. He gives kingdom speech here. I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell down prostrate to the ground and were terrified. I'd be terrified too if God showed up. He's a big God. And they lay down. And I love this next moment. And Jesus came to them, and he touches them and said, Get up, and do not be afraid, as Jesus would. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself. Did you see what just happened? This was a transference of the kingdom. It's not just the transfiguration where Jesus gets more glory of God. It literally says, I fulfilled the law of and the prophets. Did you hear it? And Jesus is left standing, and the kingdom of heaven is here. What they set up, I fulfilled. This is even before he goes to the cross, before he goes to the grave. Do you hear it? Then he tells them, when we go down the mountain, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Even though he's been telling them to take the kingdom, they are not ready to tell this message. A transference of kingdom through Jesus on earth. Matthew 16. And this is the one that I get stones thrown at me, I guess, if you're ready. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. Going back a passage. This is where Jesus mentions the church. Okay? Here it is. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, but others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This is kingdom coming to him. I also say to you that you are Peter, or Petros, Petros, and upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be, have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. And many people say, this is the moment that Jesus built the church and the institution that we know today. Jesus didn't build his rock on Peter. 
If you look at the Greek here, he calls Peter the rock, the Petros. But then he says, I'm going to build the rock, the church on the rock. Petra. Him re referring to himself. I'm going to build the kingdom through me by using the church. If you go back to the Old Testament, what is in the Old Testament, Moses strikes what? And why does he get in trouble for hitting a rock? Oh, it was disobedient. <laughs> he was supposed to speak to it. He was supposed to speak to the rock. That rock was Jesus. He laid stripes on Jesus. Do you see that? Like, this is a revelation for me because it, it goes into this in the New Testament and begins to show you all through the scriptures that Jesus is the rock. He's my stronghold. He's my fortress. He's my foundation. Upon this cornerstone, it's all over. Moses struck the rock. Basically disobedience, but telling God he knew better. He knew the different kingdom, the earthly kingdom. And this is why I'm going to tell you, you might get offended with me. If we're going to be the church, then we have to stand on the rock. We have to stand with the repent, the kingdom is here, and seek first the kingdom of heaven. For all of this, all of his righteousness and all these things will be given to us, right? We seek his righteousness, we seek him. And I leave you with these scriptures on your hearts. You decide for yourself. You can call me a heretic. I can't turn back now. The more I study this, the more the kingdom messes me up. The more the kingdom takes my life. This was the hardest week I've ever prepared for a sermon. I'm not kidding. Oppression from Satan. Things happening, right? Sickness in my family. My mom dealing with issues. Uh, Emergency situations popping up, people needing something, people driving my attention. Trying to write a sermon when the world seems to be crashing in is hard. But I stood under the rock because I know what Satan says. I'm going to snatch the kingdom word out of their ears. And he's done it for centuries. The church has no power because we have turned over the authority to the wrong ruler. We are meant to have domain on earth through him, his power. So as I set this up for the, the next couple weeks, as long as Kelly still lets me, he could change his mind. Repent. Jesus did not come to bring religion. He came to bring kingdom. Are you living kingdom? He also wants to give rule, authority, and dominion in you for the kingdom on earth in all circumstances. We have to know what the kingdom is and we have to seek it with tenacity. We have to bring it on earth. It is time for the church to be kingdom, for the spirit of God to move, for revival to take place all over the earth. To live out the principles of the parables that Kelly boldly spoke about. We can no longer think like a democracy. That's our framework. We are under a democracy. We must think and act like kingdom and kingdom citizens, children of the most high God, under his authority, his voice in this world, as royalty. So put your prince crown on, your princess tiara on. As Kelly said last week, he wants a crown. The only way we have a crown to throw at Jesus' feet is if we act like the royalty that he made us. Because if not, you don't get the crown. And you don't have one to put at his feet. Because this king doesn't die. We don't get his throne. But we're in line for it. All of the blessing. All of the peace. All of the truth. Put crowns at his feet and honor him.